It has been quite an eventful six months. And looking at the first half of 2023, we know the JSE is up 5.9%, well ahead of cash. Some of the larger US tech stocks delivered excellent double-digit returns, and for most of the year, we've seen central banks across the world cut rates. South Africans have seen some of the most severe power outages in recent history, and here to date, we've had more days of load shedding than the whole of 2022 combined. The FNB BR Consumer Confidence Index for South Africa declined further to minus 25 points in the second quarter of 2023. This was the second lowest reading since 1994. Most consumers surveyed expect South Africa to continue deteriorating further, and many are delaying purchases of durable goods. The confidence levels of higher income individuals deteriorated the most. Now, considering the cost of living crisis, it was a relief to note that food inflation came in at 11.8%, compared to much higher levels previously recorded. While we are grateful that the restaurant and hotel industry is recovering, according to the latest GDP numbers, consumers will have to pay more for dining out. Price data shows a 1.2% monthly increase in restaurant prices, with fish and seafood producing the highest annual price increase. We notice the US remaining very resilient. Q1 GDP data was revised upward from 1.3% to 2%. The Fed seemed to have briefly paused the interest rate hikes as inflation came down, but consensus is not yet clear if the rate hike cycle is over. The Positive Home Builders Index, Positive Capital Expenditure Plans and US consumers spending excess savings all tend to show continued economic strength, begging the question whether a US recession is still on the cards. The near full employment numbers, however, should be considered a near-term risk factor for a potential US recession. China was off to a great start at the beginning of the year. However, recent data would like to indicate a much slower growing economy. Retail sales, investment sales, and even property sales are all sluggish. More concerning is the urban youth unemployment number, which surpassed the 20% mark, the highest since 2018. China is also facing deflation, as consumer prices unexpectedly flattened in June. A quick reminder of where we are at and where we were a year ago. The JSE was at 68,934 points at the end of July 2022, while at the end of June this year closed on 76,027 points. The repo rate is still rising and is up from 5.5% a year ago to 8.25%. The RAND had a terrible month uh, or terrible time during the month of May, but managed to close end of June on 18 Rand 82 to the US dollar depreciating from 16.63 one year ago. Our little timeline also makes us remember some interesting events such as the government announcing the ESCOM bailout plan in October 2022. And you might recall earlier this year, the FATF grey-listed South Africa. Monthly, we share some interesting numbers with you, such as the oldest company still listed on the JSE and also listed on the New York Stock Exchange being DRD Gold. They listed in 1895. Another interesting number is $45 trillion. This is the increase in global debt post the COVID pandemic. Now let's quickly recap what happened to some indices. The all bond index is up 4.58% for the month of June. The 10 year yield is at 10.51%. And if you decide to purchase a retail savings bond, the five year rate currently is at 11.75%. The Olsey was up 1.35% for the month of June. And one of our local equity managers, Fairtree, is seeing significant opportunity in the SA Inc. counters, especially when they consider fundamental valuations. But they are, however, cautious to pivot too aggressively given poor economic growth and poor consumer sentiment. They remain overweight cyclical stocks and defensive stocks such as gold miners and global industrials. And speaking about industrials, it has been the subsector that returned in excess of 34% for the last 12 months. 
We again look at the four investment pillars this month, as we believe this is the most suitable way to view and evaluate the outcomes-based strategies. We consider the optimal growth portfolio. Now, the first pillar is that the portfolio managed to deliver on the outcome. If you consider the RAND Sense outcome, if you invested 100 Rand seven years ago, you would have, 108, you would have had 187 Rand and 41 cents available at the end of June. Now this is well in excess of what the CISA multi-asset high equity category would have delivered. The consistency pillar shows how difficult it was for the CISA category to constantly and consistently achieve CPI plus 5% over rolling seven year periods. This category could only deliver or exceed CPI plus 5% 23% of the time, while the optimal growth strategy managed to do so 61% of the time. Very important point to consider is that we do not manage this consistency at the cost of risk. In fact, risk management is the third pillar and when considering that both the strategy and the CISA category can have a negative one year, it is interesting to note that by means of how we manage money and our philosophy, we have a lower probability to deliver a one year negative return number. And when we do, the number is also less significant than that of the CISA category. And finally, we end off the four pillars with preservation of capital. When considering actual seven year annualized numbers, it is clear how well we've enhanced on a CISA return data and also we highlight what the CPI was over this period, preserving the client's capital against inflation. Now we urge you to look at some of the excellent return numbers that the strategies managed to deliver and this month we highlight the steady growth, guarded growth and the optimal growth strategies and specifically showcase the outperformance against the CISA categories when considering their relevant rolling time periods. Get in touch if you would like to explore outcomes-based investing and how we ultimately reduce the uncertainty of the investment outcomes. Thank you.